everybody, and welcome to Project HR, a podcast dedicated to building better workplaces. I'm Jennifer Oroqua, COO of Projections, and your host. And if there's one thing we can all agree on, it's that people are our greatest resource. It doesn't matter what your company makes or what services you provide, what industry you work in. It's the talent you have working for you and working with you that makes a company strong, resilient, and successful. Of course, anyone who works in human resources understands the challenge of not only finding valuable talent and hiring them, but also retaining them in the months and years that follow. It's a constant, concentrated effort. And thankfully, today, we are joined by our friend Jim Bitterly, managing partner of EDSI and author of Unquittable, Finding and Keeping the Talent That You Need. Jim, we're so happy to have you back on Project HR. Jennifer, thank you. It's great to be here. And to our listeners, if Jim's voice sounds familiar to you, Jim joined us last season to talk with us about succession planning, and he's back again this season to talk about this new book. So, Jim, why did you decide to write this book? Why write it now? Well, you know, it's interesting. Of course, we started writing this um, before the the pandemic broke out, Mm -hmm. Uh, so things have changed a little bit. But, you know, we've done turnaround work in our firm for many years, um, and that's been one of the services that we've done. And what we've seen is many, many companies fail uh, because they just have done a horrible job attracting, retaining, and developing talent, right? Mm -hmm. And it's really got to the point where we saw a lot of the same mistakes being made over and over and over again. And it hurt the company, it hurt the people, and it was really kind of bad for everybody. So we thought, well, why don't we just focus on helping supervisors, managers, and leaders really understand what's going on in the talent world and help them be better managers to create more engaging workplaces so that they're more successful and so that the people that work for them are more successful and happier. I love that. That all makes that all makes sense. So we're all well versed in the reality of the the war for talent, you know, skills gaps that can harm companies sooner rather than later. In light of those realities, how important is it that we all be at the top of our talent strategy game? Well, you know, I, I've always said that people are everything. You know, if you look at a, a sports team, let's look at football, for example. Uh, if you have great athletes and you put them together, um, they have the potential to do exceptionally well, mm-hmm. right? It's true in business. Um, you really want to attract and retain the best talent you can and put them in an environment where they're going to be engaged and where they're going to succeed. And it's interesting because as things have changed, we, we've seen over the last really five or six years, a plethora of companies actually failing. And when we would go back to the root cause of their failure, it's related to talent. So talent today is more important in good talent management and a good talent strategy is more important, I think, now than it has ever been. Yeah, it's great. So, so you start out the book describing four corporate fail waves, like events that have led us to where we are today. Can you tell our audience about each of these fail waves? Yeah, it's pretty interesting because, uh, so uh, let me first of all mention, I am a baby boomer. <laughs> um, I've, I've been around to witness all of these fail waves. Mm-hmm. And really, the, the, so there are four, right? The first one was quality. The second was cost. The third was technology. And now the new one is talent. And the quality fail wave uh, was really back in the early 70s. And um, so I'm from Detroit, and I saw it up close and personal. Um, the quality wave swept this country, and it started with Japanese cars. Um, mm-hmm. When you think back to the early 70s, we saw, for example, Toyota and Honda enter the U.S. with very um, basic but highly reliable, affordable, no-frills vehicles. Mm-hmm. And from a manufacturing standpoint, Toyota had implemented uh, a, an entirely new quality system. And once they did that, uh, it changed manufacturing, frankly, forever. Mm-hmm. Um, and what we learned is there are ways to manufacture consistently good products. And what we saw is those companies that couldn't catch on or weren't willing to change in terms of how they manage and how they develop quality products, that those companies were not going to be able to compete and they would fail. You know, mm-hmm. I use the example of think about Toyota and where they are today. Mm-hmm. And then I think about American Motors, <laughs> right? It's a mm-hmm. brand. It's a company that's not even around anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and a big chunk of that reason was because they could not keep up in terms of building a highly reliable, high quality vehicle, and therefore people abandoned them. 
The second wave was really cost related. And we used to call it the race to the bottom, right? Mm-hmm. Who could be the mm-hmm. low cost producer? And that became mm-hmm. a common catchphrase when people were doing strategic planning. Um, and a, a perfect example here is Walmart versus mom and pop general stores. Mm-hmm. Um, think about, you know, if you go back, I can remember being a kid in the late sixties and early seventies in every town you went to, you would see general merchandising stores mm-hmm. uh, and they were generally mom and pop type shops. Now you rarely see those because Walmart has taken over, right? Okay. And for Walmart, the whole game was cost, a big selection at the lowest possible cost. And it drove many, many businesses out of business. And and we saw that happen in a number of industries. The next wave of failures, um, and this occurred in the 90s and early 2000s, was technology related, Mm -hmm. right? There were those organizations that that chose the right technology, that invested in the right technology that have done very well. And there are others that have failed. And the perfect example there, right, is Netflix and Blockbuster. Mm -hmm. I remember when my kids were little on a Friday night, we'd go to Blockbuster, we'd pick out a movie. It was a big deal, right? It was kind of a family event. Mm -hmm. And then Netflix came along. So today you do not see um, uh, Blockbusters anywhere. Uh, I think there's one left in the United States uh, and it's on the West Coast. Um, And Netflix is ubiquitous. I mean, uh, Mm -hmm. I think we probably have three different Netflix accounts just in my family alone, right? Um, So you have to pick the right technology. If you didn't, uh, there were literally thousands of companies that failed because they picked the wrong technology. Mm -hmm. And now we're at the very beginning of the talent fail wave. And um, I will give you a a classic example here. Um, We have a client that's a manufacturing company and they manufacture uh, components that go into high-end cars. And this particular company, we got called in because they were in trouble. And what happened really is they lost two of their three largest customers in a matter of about six months. And once they lost those customers, they went into a financial distress situation. They had cash flow issues. Mm-hmm. Their bank wanted them out. Um, they, they, were, they were literally going down the drain uh, very quickly. And when we looked at it, it was really an issue of service and quality. But mm-hmm. the root cause beneath it was they had an assembly department in this facility. And in the assembly department, they had a terrible culture. They were paying 10 bucks an hour. Mm -hmm. And the head of HR basically said to me, Jim, I'm just trying to find warm bodies that can pass a drug test that'll show up, right? And so they were rushing people into their assembly. And these folks were not trained properly. They weren't the best workers to start with. And so they they were slow. So their service, they weren't able to keep up. And they hadn't been trained properly and they were making quality mistakes. And those quality issues were getting through to their customers. Mm -hmm. And it almost made the company fail and become a chapter seven, um, in which case the company would no longer exist. So today um, we're actually seeing that as a common root cause for corporate failures. They can't attract and retain the talent that they really need, not only to just to, to grow or thrive, but just to run their business on a very basic level and survive day to day. So, you know, I'm sure all of us are sitting here thinking, you know, how could these companies fail so spectacular? How could they not see this? But in your book, you actually pin the blame for this on two, a couple of different types of leadership. Can you tell yeah. us about that? So there, there, there's more than two, but there's two big ones that we see. Um, you know, the first one is what I call the s- smartest person in the room syndrome. And we've seen that many times where you have maybe an owner or a CEO that just frankly thinks they're smarter than everybody else and doesn't listen to everybody else and tends to create an environment where people are not uh, engaged, um, they're not empowered, um, and it flows down through the organization and makes it really not a great place to work, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And that's a big issue. The second type are are just, frankly, older leaders like myself, Mm. you know, baby boomers Mm. that grew up in a very different environment that are unwilling to be flexible and to change, right? When you think about like, so I think about my very first job as a kid coming out of school, you know, I felt like I was lucky to get the job um, and Mm -hmm. 
I put up with a lot of the crap just thinking, well, this is just how it is. And I didn't hear really different stories from my friends that were working elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So I just thought, hey, you know, when you get a job, uh, as kids say today, adulting is not always easy. Right. Sure. Um, and so I just figured, well, that's what it's like. And there's going to be lots of good and lots of bad wherever you work. And you put up with it and you shut up and you work hard and uh, go forward. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, um, it started with the Gen Xers and certainly now with the millennials, they have a very different view of work. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I believe, and it took me a while to come to this conclusion, they have a very good attitude about work mm -hmm. and what the work environment should be. Mm -hmm. um, so the mistake is older leaders, and, and let's face it, generally, people leading organizations tend to have been there for a number of years. They mm -hmm. tend to be a little bit older and they may have some of those same preconceived ideas about what work is as I do, right? Mm -hmm. Or as yeah. I did. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, um, that environment and creating that sort of leadership and environment doesn't work for younger workers. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're going to fail and you're going to struggle to attract and retain those younger workers. And let's and, and millennials today mm -hmm. are the largest part of our workforce. Right. Um, so we have to be very skilled at creating an environment where they're happy and where they're engaged. Mm -hmm. So you showed some personal humility here, identifying yourself as one of these baby boomer bosses. How have you personally managed to avoid these kind of generational mistakes? <laughs> well, you give me a lot of credit there, Jennifer, because I <laughs> haven't uh, avoided all of them, believe uh. me. You know, look, we all make mistakes, and I think we all learn more from our mistakes than our successes. Sure. And I look at our company today, right? We've been around for over 40 years. We've got about 900 employees. But um, there was a period where we struggled to retain um, younger workers. Hmm. And it was because a lot of the folks running the company are like me, right? Mm -hmm. And we had mm -hmm. different ideas about what work is um, and what a culture, a workplace culture should be like. So um, what we did is we ultimately made mistakes but once we started to really assess why people were leaving, what the mistakes were that we were making, and we learned a lot through exit interviews, by the way. Mm -hmm. And then we just said, we're going to make this part of our continuous improvement. And, and we're going to make a goal um, of having a uh, what we call a destination workplace, where we are considered one of the best places to work mm -hmm. in our mm -hmm. area. Um, and, you know, and it was hard. It's been a real journey. Sure. Um, you know, last year, uh, we were the only company in our in Michigan to win all of the Best Place to Work Awards. Nice. So we were very excited about that. Sure. And we still have a long way to go. I think there's still dozens of things we can change to get better and better and better. But um, we made lots of mistakes um, and we've learned from them. And part of why, again, going back to the book is... I wrote the book so a lot of folks don't have to make the same mistakes we make <laughs> sure. or that we've seen uh, our clients make. Yeah, I love that. You make a point in the book about the shift from thinking of people who work for you as employees or workers to thinking them as, of, of them as talent. So why is that distinction so important? Mm, yeah. So first of all, uh, I think there's two elements here. One is when I think of talent versus an employee or a worker, talent is has an elevated place in my thought process in terms mm -hmm. of it seems like it's more valuable than the phrase worker, right? Sure. Yeah. Um, and also, when you think about an employer or a worker, you set them into a system where you think about, they work for me, I tell them what to do, they get paid. There's a relationship, right, that's mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. fixed. Mm -hmm. um, when I think of talent, I think of something very different. I look at my job is not to give them direction and to pay them with talent talent, a big chunk of my responsibility is to really kind of figure out what are their real strengths? What are their talents? And how do I best put them into a situation where they can thrive and use their talent um, to, to, to really excel in their own personal career, but also to help the company? We've seen study after study after study that tells us when people are doing what they like and what they're good at, um, they're happier. Right. And they tend to do better for the company and they're more engaged. So mm -hmm. it's good all the all around if we can think about people that way versus just the classic boss, 
employee relationship, right? Right, um, right. I, I almost turn it on the ear, right? Where I'm the servant and my job is to make sure that we get those people into a spot where they're going to thrive. And mm -hmm. you can take a very average or even a below average worker. And if you put that person into an area that they're excited about, mm -hmm. and it's something that they really like to do, um, they can really be, you can turn them from being a, an average or below average employee to somebody that really uh, is a star. Yeah, that's fantastic. And that's why you guys have won awards for being a great employer. We um, we have a big quote on the wall at Projections. It's um, Steve Jobs. And he says, uh, we, we don't hire smart people so we can tell them what to do. We hire smart people so they can tell us what to do. And so I really <laughs> I really like that. I, 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 I hope that we, we embody that in our culture. Yeah, that was one of the things that Steve really got right. He was yep. an interesting person. Um, yes, agreed. But that's one thing that I, th I I think I agree with him on. And interesting leadership style, but that one that one quote kind of embodies how I feel that we should approach talent. Isn't so when you, when you talk about talent strategies, what are you talking about there? Are you talking about like finding and retaining talent? What else is involved there? Um, really good question. Yeah, t talent strategies to me, it's not only um, uh, attracting. Uh, you know, finding talent, it's retaining that talent, it's developing that talent. And what are those strategies to put them not only to, to get them to keep them and develop them, but how to get them engaged? How do you put them into an environment where they're going to be a really good employee for the organization, mm -hmm. and where they're going to be happy, right? Mm -hmm. Where they're going to be fulfilled. So talent strategies go, go beyond just the, the basics attract, retain, develop. Um, it's really then what's the next step? How do you get them to perform at a very high level uh, without being, hey, this is all about money and hit your quota. Right. This is about how do we put you into an environment where you are personally engaged in what mm -hmm. you're doing. And typically when people are engaged, you're A, they're going to stay at the company. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to develop themselves a lot. Uh, but they're also going to do great work for your organization. And it's amazing when you see people that are really, really engaged in what they're doing. Yeah, you're, you're spot on there. And I, I love the idea that that's what moves our organizations forward. It really is that inspired talent. All right, Jim. So we're going to take a quick sponsorship break right now. But when we return, we're going to explore strategies in all of these areas in greater detail. So stay with us. Thanks to this week's Project HR sponsor, LaborWise Leadership. LaborWise Leadership provides your frontline leaders with the knowledge they need to help you avoid third-party interference in your business. With this powerful online course, you'll teach your leaders how to create greater engagement while remaining union-free. Get your free trial at projectionsinc.com slash LaborWise. We're back with Jim Bitterly, managing partner of EDSI and author of Unquittable, Finding and Keeping the Talent that You Need. So Jim, let's talk about attracting talent to start. What, what role does employer brand play in attracting great talent? Attracting talent, as we all know, right, is has been so painful uh, hmm. over the last five, six, seven years. And it's interesting because even with the pandemic, we're still seeing clients that we have struggling to attract the talent that they need. Hmm. Right. In fact, I, I, I just read this. Um, so it's timely. Um, if you go back to the beginning of the year, uh, we had a record number of open positions in America, almost eight million open positions. We hmm. had essentially more jobs than we had uh, qualified workers. Right. OK. Do you know that number today uh, at the beginning of September in the in the middle of this pandemic was six point five million open positions? Wow. So attraction, even though st a little bit of steam has come out of the kettle um, with COVID-19, the reality is it's still a huge issue. And employer brand is just one of those great tools that everybody should have a focus on. And think about it this way. So employer brand is this. What do people say about working at your organization? Think about if I surveyed everybody that works at Project HR, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. right? And I said, tell me what it's like working here. Mm -hmm. And then I took all of the feedback and I boiled it down to the three or four critical things that I heard time and time again. That's your employer brand. Hmm. And so if you're a, let's say a, 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 a retailer or a lumber yard that works in a small community, mm -hmm. right? And you have one competitor, um, that's another comparable business that works close to your community or in your community. And let's say you, you're a sweatshop, you work people hard, you pay them very little, you treat them poorly, and your competitor takes care of people, mm -hmm. um, treats them well, has a good culture. What happens is people in the community begin to understand working at company A is really good. Everybody wants to work there. Working at company B stinks. Mm -hmm. And people know that. There's a lot of word of mouth. There's a mm -hmm. lot of discussion out there. People know the good companies to work for. They know the bad companies to work for. <laughs> and what happens is good employees are, are always trying to find their way to the good employer. And what happens then is those that can't get jobs anywhere else end up at the bad employer. Mm -hmm, and the sure. two, then, you know, the flywheel effect takes effect and the good company mm -hmm. gets better, the bad company gets worse. Mm -hmm. um, and employer brand is critical to that, right? It is your reputation as an employer. Mm -hmm. um, I will tell you, since we went on a very focused effort at EDSI just to become known as a great place to work. You know, we used to struggle to get to fill a lot of open positions. We didn't attract as many prospective employees as we wanted to. Mm -hmm. And then I look at where we are today. And if we post any job, um, we get dozens, sometimes hundreds of applicants mm -hmm. for positions. When, and that never used to happen. And it's largely because our brand has become stronger and stronger and stronger. And people now want to work for us versus... Sure not knowing who we are. Yeah. And that's how you get the best of the best, obviously, when you get that great talent pool to pull that's from. That's right. So what kind of tools and strategies can we use to improve our employer brand and make companies more appealing to quality candidates like you're describing? Yeah. Um, so there, look, there's a lot of different things you can do, right? The, the most important thing is focus on your culture. Come up with an aspirational culture that you, you know, what is that culture that you want to have? Mm -hmm. And what is that employer brand that you want to have? And where are you today? And then figure out how do you migrate from where you are to where you want to be. But let me give you one really simple tool. Um, so everybody knows about Glassdoor, right? Sure. Um, mm -hmm. I'm assuming yep. that uh, everybody listening to this podcast is probably written a review in Glassdoor, has reviewed Glassdoor, has used Glassdoor, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and here's, uh, I'm working with a client right now. They do amazing work in their community. It's a nonprofit. They've got 400 employees and their Glassdoor score was 3.2, which is not a great mm -hmm. score. Mm -hmm. And and yet, when I was inside the organization, it didn't feel like a 3.2 Glassdoor score company to me. And so what we learned is that the only people that were really going to Glassdoor were the people that had left the organization for one reason or another. Right, sure. So we then created a program to encourage all employees to go to Glassdoor and to rate the company honestly. Hmm. And then our intention was to use the information we saw there to get better better. Hmm. And interestingly enough, just simply getting existing employees to go, go to Glassdoor and rate the CEO and rate the company, the scores went from the low threes to the mm -hmm. low fours mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in a matter of months. Nice. Right. And so when young people are, are investigating, interviewing for my client, or mm -hmm. going to work there, they're going to Glassdoor. Mm -hmm. I mean, th these young kids, they're smart. I mean, they're going to check it out and they're going to see what other people say about it. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, we've seen an immediate uptick in applications. Um, we, you know, we, we see an immediate uh, down uh, turn in the length of time it takes to fill an open position. Mm -hmm. um, so that was just a very simple strategy. Let's yeah. make sure that current employees are giving us ratings on Glassdoor and it made a tangible difference. Yeah. Sometimes just asking for that feedback is all you need for that, that little boost there. Right. So we're talking about continuous learning, educating employees, um, you know, th that you have now to take on future roles. And do you, do we try and fill knowledge gaps from within? Are we, how are we grooming our talent for the future? 
we always say you, you no matter how big your organization is, you ought to have your own corporate university, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and I'm not going back to the days where there was GMI, General Motors Institute, or you know, uh, General Electric has its a very large corporate university, McDonald's, Hamburger U, right? It doesn't mm-hmm. have to be that. So first of all, you should have your own. But kind of taking a step back, you know, I always encourage organizations to have clear career paths, you know, ladders going straight vertically up a function and also lattices that move through different functions Mm -hmm. and then building your training based on the ladders and lattices, how people might move so that when they move, they can be successful. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to develop your talent so that when you do promote them or move them into a new role, they're going to be successful and that you've prepared them for that new role. But also, um, it's very important, I think, for all organizations to develop their develop their own, promote their own, but also to seed the organization with some talent from the outside. Because if you do nothing but, and, and this is contrarian with what some people believe, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people will say you should do nothing but hire from within. Mm-hmm. Well, the reality is you you tend to get too much uh, uh, inbred type of thinking yep. because you yep. haven't seen the way it's done elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And that becomes very problematic for a lot of organizations. So bringing in some fresh perspectives from other industries or competitors allows you to have a better sense of, hey, this is what my competitor is doing mm-hmm. and having better understanding of who you're competing against and really learning maybe some best practices from other organizations. Because if you're only developing your own people and promoting from within, um, then you're only going to get best practices that you're able to develop, period. Now, should the majority of your folks be developed and promoted from within? Yes, but you should absolutely seed the organization with some people from the outside. You know, and, 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 and then really then once you build career ladders and lattices, you should have your corporate university should have trainings that are um, specifically tied to each step in the ladder or lattice. And then there should also be training beyond just skills, right? There should be knowledge. There should be institutional knowledge you're sharing, competitive knowledge you're sharing, cultural knowledge you're sharing. We're working right now with a client. We're trying to get them to uh, really train every employee on the type of leadership that they, they are encouraging throughout their organization to make sure they understand the core values uh, of the organization and what that means to their culture. They're, uh, they're training them on behaviors that, they're, that they encourage and behaviors that they discourage. So um, training and development isn't just skills. It goes well beyond that. And it really can be powerful when you're trying to create a great, uh, highly engaged workplace. And, and then, of course, right after that, we're talking about, you know, retaining talent because we do have those great employees that we already have with, within. You know, why, why is talent retention so difficult? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, and it's gotten worse, right? It's gotten really, sure. really hard. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Some of it is the generational changes that are going on. Mm-hmm. Some of it is just pure statistics, right? There's uh, today with the pandemic going on, we have 6.5 million open positions. Right. Right. And uh, so so some of that is there. And why is it so difficult? Well, a lot of companies are really raising their game. Right. Mm-hmm. They're they're mm-hmm. getting really smart about creating a great place to work environment, creating mm-hmm. a great culture. And what we're seeing is the difference between the winners and the losers is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Hmm. The companies that are really catching on to creating a great culture and a great work environment are thriving. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting that I didn't I didn't really initially understand the value of this. But that is when you see a company really transforming their culture and creating a great a great environment, not only is it better in terms of retaining and, and attracting your talent, but the, the more mature workers that have been there for a long time also become more engaged and happier and start to realize, oh gosh, 
this is a great work environment. We Mm -hmm. never did this before and they're having more fun. Mm -hmm. So that's really important. It, so it's very difficult because th- th- you have those companies that are doing a great job and they're growing. And so what are they doing? They're poaching people from the companies that aren't doing such a great job. Mm-hmm. And those companies in the middle or on the bottom, the wrong end of that spectrum, they are struggling because they just can never fill all the positions in their organization because they're bigger competitors or competitors that are growing, that have done a great job with their culture and they're stealing people from them. Um, Mm -hmm. so it has been really interesting to watch and there's some great retention tools out there too. Um, if you want to, want to talk about those. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about your, the glass door kind of hack that you gave us for, um, improving our employer brand. What, what tools or strategies can we use to retain that talent? Yeah. So look, there, there's a lot, right? The, the, having a great culture helps. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not just one thing, but the, the, the one area that we're finding and that we're seeing that research tells us time and time again has a huge impact on retention is creating a flexible work environment. If you can build a flexibility program into your organization, it will probably have a bigger impact on retention of talent than anything mm-hmm. else you can sure. do. Yeah. Right. And it's amazing because there there's no silver bullet. There isn't like one flexibility system that works for everybody. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes there are multiple different types of flexibility systems that you may need to use for different departments or areas, even within your own company. Mm -hmm. Right. But flexibility systems have had a huge impact on retention. Oh, there's one other thing I want to mention that's related to the pandemic. I think we've all learned that many of us can do a lot of our work from home. Working from home is part of that flexibility um, sure. in terms of retaining talent. So what we're starting to see is a lot of organizations saying on a permanent basis, um, pe- certain jobs are working from home one, two, three, sometimes five days a week. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that you know, in a lot of times people don't want to be working from home five days a week, right. maybe one or two days is ideal. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that is another thing that I think is going to explode uh, over the next year or two. Yeah. Yeah. I think people have seen the possibilities and those are some really inspiring ideas. Jim, we're going to take some time out for another quick break and we'll be right back after this. You're listening to the Project HR Podcast. I'm your host, Jennifer Oroqua, and our guest today is Jim Bitterly, managing partner of EDSI and author of Unquittable, Finding and Keeping the Talent You Need. We are back. So, Jim, is it possible for a company to implement these kind of talent strategies without breaking the bank? Yeah, it really is. In fact, um, most of them don't really take a lot of money. They do take some resource, they take some time, and they take commitment right? Mm -hmm. I always tell people, for example, build a talent dashboard so you can measure, um, you know, what is my employee net promoter score, which is Mm -hmm. really the best metric Mm -hmm. for engagement. Measure morale. Um, We have a very specific question we ask there. Measure your turnover. Measure Mm -hmm. um, how many applications do you typically get for an open position? How long does it take you to fill an open position? Mm -hmm. You know, putting a talent dashboard in place is great. It costs you nothing to do. And it allows you to then start measuring the changes you make in terms of, am I making my culture better? Am I making this company more of of an attractive workplace? Mm -hmm. Um, Flex systems. They really don't cost. People are still going to work the same amount of hours. And what we've seen is in flex environments, people are less likely to leave the company and they tend to they tend to work more hours mm-hmm. and be more engaged. Mm-hmm. So it's all good and it doesn't cost you anything. You know, even frankly, one of the things that sometimes can be costly is building your own corporate university. But a lot of times you have talent inside. It just takes somebody to kind of own it, right? Mm-hmm. And then sure build the trainings in a logical, structured way. Right. Um, so for the most part, it's it's really not an expensive thing. Going through a cultural transition, frankly, it's not an expensive process to go through. It's just really changing some processes and behaviors and getting really focused on what's important in your organization. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And putting the energy behind those things to put them in, in place, that makes perfect sense. So you're the managing partner at EDSI, and it's fair to say that a number of the services your company provides revolve around these kinds of talent concerns. Can you share with our listeners how EDSI can help? 
Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, so we do um, we're, we're 900 employees. We're all over the eastern half of the U.S. Uh, and on the consulting side of our business, we do cultural transformation, mm-hmm. succession planning, a lot mm-hmm. of customized training, um, everything from boot camps where, hey, you got to hire 30 new people for a new uh, job that maybe you won, uh, all the way into building corporate universities. We do turnover remediation. Um, mm-hmm. We'll develop career paths. Uh, for your organization. Uh, And that's really on the talent management side, but we can also do, we do strategy. uh, So we help organizations with strategy, turnarounds, operational improvement, et cetera. So thank you for asking. Sure, sure. So, and and follow up to that, you know, how can our listeners learn more about EDSI and what you have to offer? Sure. Um, Yeah. If you go to edsisolutions.com, you can go to our website and you can learn a lot about us there. Or you can just send me an email, uh, jbitterly at edsisolutions.com. And uh, I'm happy to help out any way I can. Excellent. That's so nice of you. I want to let our listeners know that a link to buy Jim's book, Unquittable, Finding and Keeping the Talent You Need, will be included in this episode's companion guide. And we'll also include information on EDSI. So be sure to sign up for it today at projectionsinc.com slash podcast. Right now, though, Jim, it's time for our lightning round questions. And these are questions we ask of every guest of the podcast. Are you ready? Oh, man, I'm ready. (laughs) You've been here before, so. (laughs) All right. So the first question is always a topic showdown. In this episode, we've been talking about talent. In your opinion, which of these popular talent TV shows is best? America's Got Talent or The Voice? Oh, it's got to be the voice. Yeah, my I wife agree. and I watch it religiously. Yep. And uh, and we laugh and we really enjoy it. Yeah, we do too. We do too. So, um, next question: What is the best book that you've read recently? Oh, um, I really think it was Thomas Jefferson, The Art of Power. Uh-huh. Um, and I have to uh, be honest; I did it audio book. And you know, it's really interesting when you read about the beginning of our country. And when you read about the, the founding fathers mm-hmm. and, you know, they were just people, right? right. I mean, right. I, I think there was great inspiration, but it, it was an experiment and we're supposed to be continually looking at it and making it better as we go. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think uh, it's really opened my mind to the way they thought and how they wanted this to evolve. And it's a great book and I, w- I would yeah. encourage anybody to read it. I will definitely look that up. That sounds like some great inspiration. Um, So what's your favorite thing about working on talent strategy? I love when I see leaders actually start to really value culture and their people. And then I actually see them become more engaged and happier at work because all of a sudden everybody's working in an environment where they care about each other more and they're they're trying to get people uh, focused on the things that they're really good at. Um, and so you just see people generally getting happier when we have success on these mm-hmm. strategies. Love that. So what general piece of advice would you give to new talent? That's a great question. Um, there's so many things I'd like to say to new people, but when it's somebody brand new, um, hey, you know, it is, it's always going to be work. It's never going to be perfect. You're, you know, even rock stars have bad days. Right. Um, so not everything you're going to, you do is going to be fun, but people that have a great attitude that are dependable and that really support the people they work with and, and, and focus on doing things you like, right, to some extent, mm-hmm. um, you're going to be successful. And don't, don't be afraid. If you're in a company and you're, you're, you're working in a job that you're not crazy about, you might be a great worker with a great attitude. You don't necessarily have to leave that company to find another job. Talk to the folks inside your organization. Say, hey, I would love to stay here. But what I've learned is, you know, maybe working in the warehouse is not my thing. Mm -hmm. Are there opportunities maybe in customer service or inside sales or whatever Mm -hmm. it might be? Because what happens is people can then begin to navigate and drive their own career. And a lot of times it means not even have to leave the company that you're with. Right. Love that permission to stumble and grow. Yes. (laughs) So, So how do you hope to inspire others? Well, 
I, you know, I really hope that when people start to make changes in the culture and in their work environment, I, I want people to feel good about it, right? What I find is um, a lot of organizations that really make strides uh, in terms of building a great culture and improving the engagement levels of their employees, the people are people are happier. They enjoy working together. They support one another more. Um, you just find, and I and I think that when people are happy at work, they're happier at home too, right? Mm-hmm. They go home, mm-hmm. they're in a better mood. They're not, you know, just spent. Uh, right. And I think it. So it really can. Um, I I hope that we're we're making lives better for everybody involved. Love that. So I wanted to thank our listeners for joining us today on this week's episode of Project HR. And Jim, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jennifer. Great, great questions. uh, And always happy to help if anybody wants to talk about this. Love that. Thanks. So thanks too to our listeners. And once again, this is your reminder to grab the companion guide for this episode at projectionsinc.com slash podcast. If you'd like to be on Project HR or you know someone who would, email us at projecthr at projectionsinc.com. And last, but certainly not least, make sure you never miss an episode of Project HR. Subscribe to the podcast, drop us a line, leave us a review, or simply give us a handful of stars wherever you get your content. That's it from me for now. Let's make it a great day at work.